Hi all, today we're going to discuss hypertension in African Americans. So in order to discuss hypertension in African Americans, it might be informative to begin with the prevalence of hypertension among all U.S. adults 18 and over. So one thing to note is this is self-reported that we're looking at here in this map. So have you, in the self-reported question was, have you ever been told by a doctor, nurse, or other health professional that you have high blood pressure? This excludes gestational hypertension. It's also estimated that around 8% of the U.S. adults have undiagnosed hypertension, which therefore is not accounted for in this map. So untreated or uncontrolled hypertension is one of the most powerful and prevalent risk factors for heart disease and stroke in the United States. And that the average lifespan of African Americans is significantly shorter than white Americans, and it's mostly because of heart disease and stroke. So here in this map, which is uh, for all races, age standardized for 2017, West Virginia has the highest rate of hypertension at 38.9%, followed by Alabama at 38.8%, and Arkansas at 38.6%. You don't need to know these percentages, you just use them for a frame of reference for understanding kind of where these uh, high prevalence rates are. And so also recall from our obesity video lecture, these trends were pretty similar to what we were seeing in terms of, of obesity and hypertension. So the lowest states are Minnesota at 24.2% and Colorado at 24.5%. So at this point, you should be kind of asking yourself, why do we see these trends in these health outcomes? And you should also have a fairly good understanding of how these relate to culture, lifestyle choices, and the built environment. Throughout this course, we've kind of seen these same trends for health outcomes and for the same uh, states. So in this map, kind of we're looking at hypertension in African American adults, 18 and over. And the first thing you should note from the previous map is the legend. And notice that the percentage range now goes up to 57.1% which was up from the high of 38.9%. And interestingly, in 2017, Idaho has the highest rate of hypertension in adult non-Hispanic blacks at 57.1%, followed by Alaska at 53%, and Utah at 52.6%. So while these rates are high, the larger percentage of African Americans live in the South, so much of the preventative and treatment measures are focused uh, in the South. So in the week 14 folder in Blackboard, I posted a video that provides a good overview of what hypertension is and the causes. So if you haven't watched that yet, please do so, as it kind of gives a good understanding of what hypertension is. So the prevalence of hypertension and its consequences remain high in African Americans. So in this table, we can see that non-Hispanic Blacks have an age-adjusted percentage of 32.8% compared to non-Hispanic whites at 24%. So in African Americans, hypertension arises prematurely and its onset is often more severe with higher levels of uncontrolled hypertension despite patient awareness levels similar to those found in non-Hispanic whites. For example, according to research, 13.8% of African American children have high blood pressure compared to 8.4% of white children. And so studies have shown that having high blood pressure in youth makes it more likely that a person will have elevated blood pressure throughout their life. It's kind of a similar trend that we see in obesity. If children are obese, they're most likely going to be obese in their adulthood as well. Um, these kind of lifestyle and behavioral choices and stuff that are uh, instilled in an early age are just kind of carried forward in adulthood. It's hard to make these changes. Um, perhaps it's easier not to do them than to have to change. So there's this multi-ethnic study of arteriosclerosis found that relative risk of having high blood pressure that persists in older age uh, were one and a half times higher in African Americans than in white Americans through the age of 75. 
In addition, African Americans have the lowest rate of medical uh, or medication adherence and blood pressure control among all ethnicities in the United States. Differences in exposure to the environment and habits uh, have blacks and whites have also seen uh, proposed to explain their different um, prevalence of hypertension. So many potential reasons have been reported, such as economic, socioeconomic status, dietary habits, social networks, stress, and health behaviors. Uh, and the reasons for this phenomenon are found in, the, in many different things, such as the behavioral, uh, physiological, cultural differences. And we'll kind of explore some of those in the upcoming uh, slides here. So exposure to chronic stress has been hypothesized as a risk factor for hypertension. So broadly speaking, stress is conceptualized as a perception of environmental demands that are believed to exceed one's resources for adopting to the situation. The intensity and duration of exposure are presumed to be important determinants of risk. So effects of acute stressors on blood pressure uh, have been demonstrated, but ongoing exposure to stresses may be more plausible links to sustained blood pressure and elevated in hypertension. So there's acute, which is kind of stress right away. Somebody in a car about cuts you off, you have all the stress. Whereas ongoing or chronic stress is maybe something from depression or you're in a long-term bad relationship or work. So these are the kind of things that go on much longer. They're not, uh, short. So the impact of stress on the development of hypertension is believed to involve the sympathetic nervous system response in which releases these cataclysmines, which leads to increased heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. So the sympathetic response to acute stresses are well documented, but the process by which stress contributes to this sustained blood pressure elevation over time is not really well understood. It may be uh, repeated activation of the system, failure to return to some resting level following stressful events, uh, failure to habituate to uh, repeated stressors of the same type, or some combination that is responsible for the development of hypertension. So most adults spend a substantial portion of their lives at work, so it should not be surprised that chronic job stress can have a profound impact on health. So the most widely studied model of occupational stress is this job strain model, which kind of focuses on two characteristics of the work environment, job demands or workload and decision latitude or the degree of control an employee has in performing his or her work. So according to this model, the combination of high demand and low control referred to as kind of high strain produces the most stress, as you can imagine. You know, if you have a highly demanding job and you don't have much latitude in terms of making decisions or your work schedule and so forth, these are going to cause additional strains. So here on the screen is another study looking at the perceived stress in black adults. So I'm just reading the high, highlighted section here, hypertension developed in 30.6% of, inter, of intervals with low perceived stress, 34.6% of intervals of moderate perceived stress and 38.2 percent of intervals with high perceived stress so the, so what's important here is not knowing the percentages but to understand that as your perceived level of stress increases uh so does your your blood pressure so Let's look at uh, some reasons for hypertension here. It also is behavioral, and patients' behavior are believed to contribute significantly to hypertension disparities. Uh, recent studies have demonstrated that adherence to medication is lower in African American patients than whites, and differences in medication adherence are associated with blood pressure control disparities. Other behaviors and lifestyle factors of poor uh, adherence recommendations about weight management and low salt diets. Um, it's also recommended if you have high blood pressure to go on the DASH diet. Heavy drinking and alcoholism. Smoking, 
The smokers are uh, nearly one and a half times more likely than non-smokers to have hypertension and the use of illicit drugs. So these all may contribute or be contributing factors to blood pressure or having high blood pressure. When compared to African Americans uh, living in highly segregated locations, participants living in medium segregated neighborhood household blood pressure that was on average 1.33 uh, millimeters of mercury lower, those residing in low segregated on average were 1.19 millimeters of mercury lower. So knowing these is not really the importance, understanding that living in less segregated areas seems to uh, lower blood pressure. So more segregation, higher blood pressure. So blood pressure for black residents who predominantly moved into medium segregated locations decreased on average 3.94 millimeters of mercury. African Americans who stayed in low segregated locales saw an average decrease of 5.71 millimeters of mercury. So although single digit changes don't appear to be impressive, there's a separate study that was published in 2015 found that one millimeter mercury decline in blood pressure led to 20 fewer heart failures and 10 fewer cases of coronary heart disease and stroke per 100,000 black individuals. So there might be something to this idea of being segregated. cultural reasons. So diet is cultural. So there's a study that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association suggested that Southern cuisine may be the center of a, a tangle of web of reasons of why black American people are more prone to hypertension than white people. And again, it's kind of, there's so many different factors that are associated with hypertension that we can't just pick out one and that's going to to solve anything. It's kind of a, this web of various factors. So over the course of this study, 46% of black participants and 33% of white participants, uh, black participants were much more likely than white participants to eat a Southern style diet, which researchers defined as one that was heavily fe features fried food, organ meats and processed meats, dairy, sugar sweetened beverages, and bread. And this diet was more strongly correlated with hypertension than any other factor the researchers measured, including participants' level of stress and depression, exercise habits, income, and education level. Uh, seemed to This diet seemed to kind of explain much of this disparity. This was just one study, um, but I think, you know, diet is, is certainly a component, but as we saw, so are other kind of uh, behavioral lifestyle choices as well as maybe segregation. So according to Thomas Leviste, he's a Dean and Professor of Health Policy and Management at uh, Tulane University. He truly, to truly untangle this relationship between disease and the Southern diet, he says you have to start by understanding the African American food ways. And he says, see the traditional African-American Southern diet was really designed for survival, he said. African-Americans were not able to access a balanced, nutritious diet during slavery and during Jim Crow. What they had was organ meats and other parts of slaughtered animals that others didn't eat and greens they grew themselves. And what they did is take these scraps and turn it into what's now an internationally renowned cuisine. So it's important to recognize that the food choices are ingrained in the culture. It should not be expected that African Americans or any other race living in the South should give up their cultural foods, but it's an opportunity to incorporate them in moderation along with other African heritage foods that are based on vegetables, greens, sweet potatoes, and beans, for example. So in the African American culture, aspects present a challenge in reducing, in reducing obesity, which can result in hypertension. So multiple research studies have found that many African Americans have a cultural preference for having a larger body size, particularly for women. And so these attitudes among African Americans complicate the acknowledgement of awareness about obesity and willingness to engage in weight management programs that we talked about 
under um, behavioral choices. So people with fewer socioeconomic resources, which we've talked about in terms of obesity as well, have less education, lower income, have less healthy diets, may be less physically active, and have poor sleep quality, um, all of which can lead to early development of heart disease, risk factors, hypertension. So if you have more money, you can afford better health care, perhaps. You can afford better food, perhaps. You maybe can take more vacations. You could have more leisure time. You have more time for exercise. So income can, or having an increased income can lead to better health outcomes. So the hypothesis mechanism for association between a low socioeconomic status and hypertension includes, as I said, poor health behavior profile and greater exposure to stress, as well as the availability of fewer resources with which to cope with stress. African Americans in low socioeconomic status experience higher rates of uh, physiosocial stress factors such as chronic stress, depression, discrimination, and are more likely to live and work in worse physical and social environments. Also to kind of go back on if you're under stress for whatever reason, your job, financial relationships, poor quality sleep, you tend to make uh, poor food choices as well. And that's kind of been looked at in the research as well. So if you get good sleep, you're well rested, you're less likely to uh, reach for junk food or other unhealthy foods. So I guess to conclude this is I kind of hope you're seeing that there's just not one cause of hypertension among African Americans or for any race for that matter. So furthermore, it's quite hard to tease out what variables is most responsible, I put most in quotes, uh, since many of these risk factors are so intertwined. So perhaps kind of the best way to combat this problem is a more of a holistic approach where many of the risk factors are addressed, but as you're probably aware, change is difficult. So small steps that look at improvement and not perfection is key. Have a great day.